I would extend the repair right. facility and it'll just set up the same. So you just let it automatically. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, God. Lord God, thank you so much for this day that you've given to yes. us. And Lord, thank you. Thank you even more for your word. The word that uh, falls on our hearts. And it falls on our hearts in different ways. And Lord, I just pray that the sermon that uh, you will be speaking through me will fall on everybody's hearts here this morning. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, if you would, uh, if you wish, you can turn uh, with your Bibles, in your Bibles, the book of Matthew, chapter 13, verses 3 through 9. This is uh, a, a, a parable of the sower, which I'm sure all of you have heard many times. And, it, and Jesus was on a boat. He had gone out into the sea, and he was speaking to the multitudes, it says, from a boat. And the reason he was doing it is that there were so many people that he couldn't, you know, they were crowding, and he had to move back. But anyway, we'll pick this up on verse 3 here. Then he spoke many things to them, the multitude, in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them. But others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. The title of my sermon today is called Good Fruit Comes from Prepared Ground. All right. And the uh, main idea that I want to get across here today, and I'm going to re uh, repeat this in various ways, is the word of God, that is the seed, when it is heard, cannot grow in a person and produce fruit unless the condition of that person's heart or such that the word can take root and grow. When I was growing up, uh, when I was just a young boy, I lived, uh, I grew up in an agricultural area of Colorado on the western slope. So I was around agriculture quite a bit, and so I knew what it took to raise things, to raise crops. But anyway, when I was probably around, I would say 10 years old or so, I decided I wanted to grow my own garden. Now, I'd seen my mother do this before, and I watched her prepare the ground and do these kinds of things, but I wanted to grow my own. Kids wanted to grow things. I mean, I was a principal, and I watched little kids, you know, and they all they had garden plots for the schools and these kinds of things. Great, great exercise. A lot of things to learn there. So anyway, my mom said, okay, that's, that's fine. You know, go for it. So um, this isn't me, by the way. <laughs> and this isn't her. <laughs> but it kind of reminded me of what was going on at that particular time. So I went out and I found a place that I thought was uh, sunny enough and maybe a little bit shady at times during the day and my mom kind of helped me pick, pick a spot. And so I went out and I measured out a, a plot. Probably, I would say it was about, oh, the, the front third of this classroom, about that size. And so I had to prepare the ground first. So what I did is I had a spade or a shovel. We didn't have a rototiller. And so I had to go out and turn the ground by hand. So I would take and I'd stick the shovel in the ground turn over a clump of dirt. Let's take a step back, stick the shovel in the ground, turn over another one, and do this for the whole entire row, and then go back to the top and start again. Turn this dirt over to get that ground ready for planting. After that was done, I would take a rake that had these big long teeth or tines on it about this long, and I went out and I'd break up the clods, and break them all up, and then I'd rake this out get the rocks or anything in the big clods of grass and things out of there. So I had a nice, smooth, soft layer of dirt there to plant a garden. And then the next thing I would do is I would go in and I would, uh, I had a, a, a ball of string. I'd put a stake in the ground at one end and then I'd pull the string out and stake it at the other end and make a row, a nice straight row. I'd move it over a foot or two and do the same thing again until I had all these nice rows in this garden spot. And then I would select my seed. Uh, my mom would help me do that too, because there were only certain things that would, that would grow well um, in the particular place where we lived. And so I, I wanted to go for this thing. Well, I'm telling you I wanted all kinds of stuff. And I had to kind of 
get that uh, sort of pared down a little bit to where it was reasonable. But I wanted to plant watermelons and cantaloupe and corn and radishes and, and lettuce and onions and everything. <clears throat> and so a lot of those things did go in the ground. And then I would get water on it. And then I would start looking at it. And I would start noticing every day. I mean, from the first day I put water on it, spray it out there. I think actually I did have an irrigation, a little irrigation sort of a dish that went over there. But uh, I would go and look at it every day to see if there was anything coming up. And after two or three days, I ran in and said, Mom, there's something coming up out there. There's something coming up out there. I think it's my, my lettuce or something. And she would go out and look at it, and she'd say, well, I'm not so sure about that. And she said, you know, I think those might be weeds. I think you're going to have to wait a while and see, you know, just look, wait a little bit. And it always amazed me, and then she was right, you know. And so then after about a week or so, then some things did start to come up that were actually the vegetables. It always amazed me how quickly those weeds came up. Uh, I mean, they came up before anything. I mean, it's just amazing. The weeds grow so much faster than anything else. But anyway, um, the, the, going along with this, um, there's, as far as the prepared ground that is spoken of in the parable here, in the parable of the sower, is that it's talking about kind of like a garden spot, like I used to tend when I was a little boy. And uh, the parable is repeated two more times in the Bible, in the book of Mark and Luke. So just for some comparative purposes, I might refer to those. But uh, first of all, there's four different types of seed here. Okay, the first type of seed that is spoken of fell by the wayside. It fell by the wayside. And what happened with that seed was basically nothing. And another thing, when I was a little kid, I'd notice sometimes, you know, because we live in an agriculture, uh, cultural area, sometimes a truck or something would go off the road and somebody would spill all their, you know, their products and everything. You'd have a whole bag of corn seed or something that was just spilled right there. And the birds would eat it all up and it would never grow into anything. But it always interested me to see it, you know, a big old pile of corn seed out there that never turned into anything. But one of the things that Jesus did is he explained this parable. Now, in Joanna's uh, example, he didn't explain her parable, but, but he did explain these. And Jesus explains this parable and says in Matthew 13, 19, and if you want to look at that, you can, is that when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. Now, you say, well, what is this understanding? Because that's a key word in here. And so if you look at this, um, he, Jesus uses the word understanding six times when he's explaining these parables in Matthew 13 in verses 14 and 50. So just looking at that just closely, you know, you can look down here and it says, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of his people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes have closed, lest they should see with their hear, eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Now what's, now what's really interesting about that is that <coughs> he's talking about two different things here. He's saying there's a difference here between hearing with the ears and seeing with the eyes and you can get all this information, and you can hear all these words, and you can hear the preacher, and you can hear him talk, and the word of God is being spoken, but to understand it. What does understand mean here? So there's a difference between seeing, hearing, and understanding with the hearts. If you look at, if you look deeper into this, the understanding with the heart, or lack of understanding with heart, can refer to dull hearts, it can mean thick hearts, it can mean calloused hearts. And even later on, in Ephesians uh, 4, it talks even about blindness of the heart. You've heard that statement, blindness of the heart. So the heart's a very important thing here in terms of, of understanding. We can hear and read the Word of God, but unless our hearts are prepared, hearts are prepared like the garden spot, that our minds can understand it, and understand it or put it all together, to receive to read the word, it won't take root. Yeah. So what causes a dull heart? Well, first of all, 
uh, the people with a dull heart couldn't even hear it. They wouldn't even consider it. And we know people like that. I mean, there's people out there that hear, hear the word of a God all the time, and they're saying, no, I don't believe any of that stuff. You know, they have their reasons for it. And, but those are the people who cannot, those are the people by the wayside. I, can, I think that a lot of those people are the, it's the world. That's kind of the way I see it, the people by the wayside. And some of the word of God falls there. But there's no way that it can take root because those people aren't even in the garden. They're not even in the garden. They're not even part of the dirt. Most haven't even accepted Christ as their Savior. So what they need is they need salvation first. Okay, the second kind of land is stony places. And the seeds immediately sprang up but could not survive because they could not take root and they withered away. Jesus, again, interpreting his own parable, says that these, were, these are the ones who receive the word with gladness, but they have no root. They have no endurance. So when things happen, such as persecution, some type of affliction, they immediately stumble or fall away. And what's interesting here, too, is it seems that it's not really the amount of affliction or the weight of affliction that causes this falling away, because God gives us a way out of these things. Afflictions they occur are able to be resisted if we really know Jesus. It appears that these individuals are unable, unable to even give a little bit of resistance to Satan. We all suffer some. 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9 says, The devil is out there prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. We have to resist him steadfast in faith. We all know these people. We have them. We've seen them in our churches. We've seen them on Billy Graham. They hear a great gospel message. And it's like, I'm saved. I accept Jesus. I want Jesus in my life. Please, Jesus, come. Take me away from this stuff I'm dealing with. And they accept Christ. They might even say a prayer, commit their hearts. In two or three days, they're smoking, they're drinking, they're doing drugs or whatever. I won't use the fornicating word like they always do in our church. <laughs> They're fornicating. <laughs> They're doing all this stuff that they wanted to get away from in the first place. It's because, why? It's because of the stony ground, the stony places. The stony places are those places in their heart that they don't want to give up. They don't want to give that stuff up. The stony places are things like drugs. Feels good. Hey, man, that feels pretty good. I'm going to go do that again. It could be addictions. It could be all kinds of things. I mean, the list really there is endless. But needless to say that these people are the ones that really have some difficulty. And it's these type of people that... Uh, they, have, they probably even have good intentions. But probably what they need, they might need more support. You know, they might need uh, somebody to come alongside of them when they're first saved and to, you know, to guide them a little bit, direct them a little bit. Maybe they need some, a mentor or, you know. I, I've seen people like this in Celebrate when I was working uh, as a volunteer with Celebrate Recovery not too long ago. I would see people come in and they were just a shambles. Their life was a shambles. And they would come to celebrate recovery and they would, you know, accept Christ. And you're thinking, wow, yeah, that's what they need first. That's what they need first. And then the first step is to, you know, realize that, you know, your life is out of control. And there's, you've got to turn this thing over to a higher power, you know, all these problems. And they do that and you're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. A couple of meetings later, you never saw them again. And then you would hear about them. They were in jail. They were in prison. You know? And you say, what could we have done? What could we have done? But the thing of it is, is that the condition of the heart and not the word is what's more important. It's the condition of the, it's con it's the, condition of the heart. It's the ground. Yes. The third type. The third kind of land that we deal with here is thorns. And the thorns spring up and choke them. A garden choked by weeds and thorns. And here again was my little garden out there. And you know, as the summer wore on, first I was, hey, the garden's cool, man. 
that's all right. You know, I'd be out there tuning it all the time, and then as the summer wore on, had something else to do. Let's go swimming, let's go fishing, hang out with your friends, ride bikes, and pretty soon the garden kind of took the back seat. So I think, oh, that garden, I better get out there and see what's going on. I, go, I went out there, that thing is like this high with weeds and everywhere, everywhere. And I said, Mom, what happened here? And she said, well, you didn't take care of your garden very well, did you? <laughs> no. So I'd get out there and I'd try to pull these weeds out. But every time I went out and tried to pull the weeds out, I pulled up some good stuff with it, you know? Mm -hmm. It's because I didn't take it's because I didn't take care of it sooner. So it was the thorns. But the problem, there's a problem with this thorny land, this thorny ground. And this is a big problem. I think it's one of the biggest problems that we have in our church, in our churches, not just our church, but in churches in general, and even with us sometimes. The thorns are the cares of the world. The thorns are the things that we just can't seem to get past, you know. And it can be, it doesn't have to be bad things. It can even be good things. You know, it can be jobs. The thorns can be jobs, can be family. Um, you know, it can be things, of course. But if you, if you look at what Jesus says here, these are the ones who receive the word of God and cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desire of other things. That, now, this is from Luke. The desires of other things enter in and choke out the word making it unfruitful. Oh. Choke out the word. Mm. So, you know, we may, we may be saved. We may be living a good Christian life. You know, we might, we might be doing all the right things. We might be jumping through the hoops, and maybe that's part of the problem. Church service can be a thorn. Mm -hmm. if, it, if, it's, if a person, it's all about their service. Another thorn can be, I'm going to fix it all myself. I mean, I do something wrong, so I'm going to go out. Oh, you know what? I, I, I repent, Lord. I, you know, I, I really repent of that. And so under my own strength, I'm going to work on this thing. And you get, you know, you just keep working and you're working and you're working. And pretty soon you fall again and you get up and you're working and you're working and you're working. And your own strength becomes a thorn. Your own strength becomes a thorn. I'm sure we've all known people like this. Bottom line is we can't serve two masters as well. If we don't have any balance in our life, if it's about pride, if it's about coveting things, failure to surrender ourselves to Christ, making ourselves our own idols. I hate to say this, but man, our churches are full of these people, and I've been there myself. I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying it's a problem. I've been there myself. I can remember sitting in church with a hangover. Seriously. I can remember thinking, man, I can't wait to get out of church today and get home and watch the Broncos. You know, I can't wait to, you know, to, in my younger years, you know, go out on that date. You know, with that girl. Boy, she's really something. She's really hot. You see what I'm saying? It's like, those things are thorns. Those things are thorns. And if we put the thorns as a priority in our lives, God takes a back seat. God's word takes a back seat, and it chokes out everything. The thorns choke out his word. We can't serve two masters. That's what. Patterns of failure. Resolving to do better. Failing again. Those are all part of the problem. The, the solution to this, I would say, is some serious weeding out of thorns. How about resetting some priorities? Okay. Maybe hanging out with a different crowd? Okay. How about refocusing? How about a little life of surrender to Jesus, letting him do the weeding? Okay. How about this, Matthew 6, 25-34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you should eat or what you should drink, nor about your body, what you should put on. Is not life more than food? The body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither grow sun nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow and they neither toil nor spin. 
yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry and say what we eat, what we drink, what we wear. For after all these things the Gentiles seek. This is the final clincher here. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will has enough worries of its own. Do not worry about the thorns and the weeds. All that stuff. Seek first the kingdom of God. Okay, now for the fourth type of ground. So far, so far we've covered three kinds of ground and to whom, on where the, so the word fell on these hearts. And not a one of them was able to make the seed very fruitful. And the first uh, kind of ground was by the wayside. It was so hard that the seed couldn't even spring up. The other was stony. Couldn't permit the seed to have any roots. Third one, thorny. We just talked about that. So there's three unfruitful categories here. And now it's time to see what is the, what's the good land, the land on which the seed of the word falling gives fruit. Matthew 13, 8. But others fell on good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And Jesus explains this as well. He who hears the word and understands it. Now here's a little interpretation here meaning put, putting it together in their minds, it comes into their heart, who indeed bears fruit and produces, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Amen. Now this time the seed didn't fall by the way, it didn't stop fall on stony ground or among thorns, but it fell on good ground, composed of people who hear and understand the word. People who hear and understand the word. Okay, I'm going to make a second point here. Hearts have to be cultivated or prepared That's right. before they bring forth good fruit or even receive seeds. Amen. So let me let me just mention Luke 8, 15. But the ones that fell on good ground are those who in an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. Patience being a key word here. This, this is a fruitful category. This fruitful category is much different from the others. Notice, they understand, which I mentioned a minute ago, the word, putting it in their good and honest heart. Now, if you, if you look at this up and look deeper into it, a good and honest heart comes from God. It doesn't come from yourself. A good and honest heart comes from God. You know, the people that had no endurance, they fell immediately. But these people are enduring, they're patient. Hear their patience, they bring forth fruit with patience. And they do not give up. And then that third, that third category was choked by the cares of the world. And they, those cares that I just said, they got the top position. Here, it's kept in the hearts of the people. Not losing its position. The word of God's in the hearts. It's not losing its position for the sake of other things, it's first. And there again is the fruitful category. How many people do you know in the fruitful category? And what do they look like? Joanna, would you put that in the slide up here? Looks like this, I think, partly at least. And you've all you've all heard of the fruits of the spirit. I mean, the people, the people that we say have a good and honest heart, the people that are producing fruit, the people that are in that fourth category. Where the, where, the, where the seed has taken root and it's flourished and, there's, and the stony places are gone and the weeds are gone and, and it's not by the wayside, but it's here, it's in their hearts, it's in that fertile ground and this is what it produces. What do these people look like? Well, I, I, I know a lot of people, you know, and, and this doesn't fit everybody, but these are the people that you think, you know, and I've known people like this since I was a little boy and, and they're the kind of people that, you know, you kind of like... You know, it's kind of like Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, you know? 
And that's, that's the kind of people that I, I sort of see that, where people that you can look to, up to, people that are good mentors, people that have these attributes of kindness and self-control, and they're faithful, and they're, they, they're, there's something good about them. And it's not just good in, within themselves, but you can just tell if there's something different and good. And they're patient, and, and they love people. These are the people in your churches that, they, you know, these are the people that are always there for you as pastors. These are the people that, you know, support you. These are your armor bearers. These are the people that got your back. These are the people that don't criticize others. These are the people that don't gossip. Right. Okay. These are the people. These are the people that lift others up. These are the people that see the grace in other people. These are the people where the, it's not about me. It's about Jesus. Amen. That's those people. All right. Because they have a good and understanding heart, which comes from God, not from themselves. All right. Because from themselves, within themselves, their their ground cannot produce that. Oh. Oh. Cannot produce it on their own. It has to come from God. The, the last thing I would like to say here is uh, God cleans and dresses the plant so it will bear more fruit. All right. John 15, 1 through 16 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. You did not choose me, but I chose you, All right, amen. and appointed you so that you should go and bear fruit, and that the fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Vine dressing hurts people. It hurts sometimes. Vine dressers are the, the people that... Uh, I don't know what they call them nowadays. I call them pruners. Because when I was growing up, I saw these guys that go out and they prune the trees. And, but you have to prune <coughs> a tree or a vine or something in order, or if it's any, really any kind of a plant that produces fruit over and over again, you have to prune it in order to get it to produce more. If you just leave it, it won't do that. So you trim back the tree. And then it's, I'm not quite sure how it works. I'm not a farmer, but uh, something to do with the nutrients then go up into the up through the trunk and out into, into the areas where the this fruit actually grows. And you cut away all that stuff that doesn't matter anymore, and so all the nutrients are not wasted out there. So it produces more fruit. It has to be pruned. Pruning hurts. Pruning hurts sometimes. The people, the people in that fourth category, here's another thing that they have. They're not afraid to hurt a little bit when it comes down to it. Huh? They're not afraid to say, you know what, God, do with me what you will. I'll go ahead and be pruned. I know I mess up sometimes, but Lord, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But God, if, I need, if there's anything in my heart, if there's something in my fertile ground that needs to be taken out of there and, and dug up, maybe I missed a stone in there somewhere, then do it. It might hurt a little bit, but do it, Lord. So, in conclusion, um, and this is for you, and you know, I kind of made this sermon today for you because if you're all, some of you are pastors and pre and you're going to be preachers, and, and I'm sure all of you, you probably wouldn't be here if you, if you weren't working with people at some point in your lives. But the Word of God, it may be, it, it's, it may be spoken to all various kinds of people, and it is spoken to all different kinds of people. And it's not just the quality of the message. But it's that heart. It's the ground on which the word falls. It's the ground. You, you know, Billy Graham himself. I now, I think this is a quote of his, but I heard it somewhere that uh, that he said that something like 80% of the people that come forward at his crusades, that accept Christ and come forward, you know, they come. You've, you've seen him just as I am. You know, and they're all coming from everywhere. And, and they're coming from the upper part of the stadium, and they're coming from here and all over the place. And Billy Graham's down there, and before you know it, the whole field in front is filled with these people. He said 80% of those people 
it's all over after that. Mm. Mm. It's because the ground isn't there. The ground isn't perfect. So what I'm saying to you is maybe what we need to do if we're preachers and pastors and teachers, we need to focus more on the ground. What does that look like? What is focusing on that? The results are going to be different because the quality of the heart of the people that hear is different. The quality of the people that hear. Some are going to reject it outright. Some are going to reject it outright, and they're going to say, forget that. It's like the guy standing on the soapbox at the Bronco game, and thousands of people walk by, and they say, that guy's crazy. But there might be one person that stops and actually listens. There might be one. Others will accept it until the first affliction happens. Hey, I thought, I thought being a Christian would meant that I never had any more problems. Hey, I thought that being a Christian meant that, uh, you know, my life was going to be easy. How come I lost my job? I thought God loved me. How come I'm having marital problems? I thought God loved us, loved my family. These are tough questions. And the first questions that come up, the afflictions, they fall away. And others will receive it, but eventually will put it in the last position. And they might be all on fire for the Lord, and then at some point, it takes last position. And all the cares of the world, all those things come first. Finally, others will keep it in a good heart and an honest heart bring forth fruit. Jesus says in Luke 8, 18, take heed how you hear. Take heed how you hear. It's not only that one that hears the word, but it's also how he hears it. For many may hear the word, but only those who hear it and keep it in a good and honest heart will be fruitful. So the application for you and us as preachers or teachers or pastors or whatever, counselors, whatever we plan to do is we need to look at that heart. We need to look deeper. You know, I was uh, talking to somebody at our, at our own church the other day, and they said, you know, we have all these people stand up at our church service, and they say they're saved, and somebody comes up, and they take them into the back room, and they pray a prayer with them, and they put them on a, on a path toward church membership, possibly, but first of all, accepting Christ and knowing that that, you know, has happened, and then all of a sudden, they, don't, they never come back. And they're saying, why does that happen? Well, I know why it happens. It's because in our church, when you accept Christ and you want to start coming to church, that's, that's not just it anymore. I mean, ours is a, our church uh, actually demands some things of people. And they say, mm -hmm. yeah, they, and they say, you know what, uh, uh, membership class. Well, what's that? That means that you have to come to membership class nine Sundays, and go, huh? Oh, sorry, she said six. Six Sundays, I thought it was nine. Felt like nine. <laughs> six, six Sundays. And, and believe me now, we've been Christians for years, and we, we went to that church and joined that church. We had to go to the basic membership class. And then we had to go to another class called Growing in Christ. And I've, we've heard all this stuff before. We could teach this class. And they said, nope, you've got to be in that class. And we were in there how long, Joanna? Probably six or seven months. And we're in that class. But what all this is to say is that people come in and they think, I'm saved. Oh, my God, I heard this great sermon. And I, we have a great pastor here. And, and I love the people. And I want to join this church. And I'm, I'm saved. And, and then they go in there and go, you mean to tell me that this takes some work? A little bit of work here? You mean to tell me that I have to actually learn and do something? That's what, that's what happens. So how do we deal with that as pastors? You know, do we say, well, no more membership classes, don't have to do that anymore. No, you know, if you don't do that stuff, it's a, it's a fine balance, because if you don't do that stuff, then you end up like another church that we went to one time where, you know, you could come in and watch the sermon in the caf cafe from big screen TV, you know, and leave. Didn't even have to go into the sanctuary. You could go in and get a 20-minute sermon that was all fluffy and felt good and everything and had a lot of, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, Sunday morning they'll have something like, let's do a poll on who's going to win the Super Bowl and do it, you know, by texting and all that stuff. And take 15 minutes to do that. And, you know, that kind of stuff. And maybe get a little nugget here and there from the Word of God. 
Is that what we want? I don't think that's what we want either. So how do we deal with that? This is a good question, a good topic for discussion in your churches. So anyway, I know it's, I promise, I know I talk way too long. But I just pray that all of us, whatever it takes for us, that we can be in that fourth category. You know, and I'm not always there. I mean, goodness sakes, I, I have a hard time sometimes. We all do. Sometimes we think, I'm sure even, I know even pastors have a hard time with this. I, most every pastor I know has struggled with some thorns in their life. And, and we've all struggled with our own. But, you know, the way to that is we just need to remember to always put God first. Always, no matter whatever it takes. I mean, if we start feeling those thorns poking us, then we need to stop and we need to sit back and say, what do I need to do about that? How do I get rid of those thorns? What do I need to do? Do I need to take a break here? Do I need to stop a minute and reflect? Do I need to refocus? Do I need to figure out what God really means in my life again? Do I need to go back to step one like in Celebrate Recovery and give some things up? I don't know, people. But I do know this, that the fourth category is where we want to be. God bless y'all. Thank you.